Hello. Hello, everyone. I hope you can see my screen. Right. Okay. Good evening. My name is Trin Ting and I'm from Money Owl, an NTUC social enterprise and financial advisory firm. Thank you very much for being with us this evening for this webinar. I hope you're keeping very well during this COVID-19 situation. It has been a difficult time for many individuals, families and companies. And coming here today, some of us may still be financially okay. And perhaps some of us may be part of the 70 plus percent who polled uh, yes just now have faced financial stress. So I hope that today we can give you some handles and perspectives to encourage us during this uh, very special time. So indeed, entering into 2020, I think no one expected that we'll be facing such a big health and economic situation that has um, really led to such a sharp downturn across the globe, be it globally or even in Singapore. We are in recession now after GDP fell about 41% in the second quarter. And for many of us, where we earn our money is under stress, as almost all sectors have suffered from either demand or supply shocks. For those of us who are employees, have you faced retrenchment or a pay cut? Or maybe it's not you, but your spouse. Or maybe it's something that you are worried could happen in the future. If you're a business owner, you might be wondering, after all the schemes that the government has put out, when would everything come back to normal and do you have enough cash to survive until then? Not only is where we earn our money under stress, where we grow our money, which is the global financial markets, is very volatile. You see here the two charts. Uh, they are both of the S&P 500 index, representing the US stock market. From the beginning of the year, you know, sometime in uh, February, you see that there was a very sharp drop. And if you had, say, invested about $30,000 in the stock market of the US, you would have ended about only just 20 plus thousand uh, at the end of, uh, of, of March or towards the end of March, which is the low on 23rd of March. However, thereafter, it was a very big surge in the stock markets. But yet at the same time, all the while the headlines in the media are talking fast and furious, plunges in straight trade, GDP, surges in COVID-19, and then trade tensions as well. But yet the stock market in the US has recovered 48% from the low. And if you did not exit, you would have made all your money back. So if you're an investor, you must, must be wondering what is going on here? Why are markets going up when there is a recession? Is it sustainable? Would there be a double dip? And what should you do with your money? I would like to suggest to us that in this time of COVID, there may be three types of decisions that you may need to make. Financial planning decisions, investing decisions, and life decisions. Now, this crisis can be a good opportunity to make those uh, wonderful and appropriate life decisions for ourselves and our families, even though a crisis is not a good thing in itself. To talk, to talk through these three decisions, I'd like to use this framework of a personal money equation. Now, each of us has a personal money equation. It is simple, but during a crisis like this especially, it is good to use this equation to reflect and learn something from it. Our personal money equation begins uh, what we call on the left side with financial planning, and it starts with income. And after putting aside our savings and fixed expenses that we cannot avoid, such as mortgages and mortgage payments, insurance payments, what we have left behind would be for our variable spending. The savings that we have, we invest them, multiply by returns compounded by the number of years to help us reach our future goals like retirement. So that is the left side. And the left side of the personal money equation is really about our short-term financial planning. It is what you might call the boring side. But it is a very, very important site because this is the site of the money equation that will help you become financially well or quote unquote rich. This is the side of the equation that you can better control. On the right side is really our long term investment strategy. This is the site that actually helps us stay financially comfortable or stay well. Now, many people think that it's the right side, the investment side, that helps us uh, become rich or well. No, it's actually the left side because that is what, where we actually have the savings to be able to put towards longer term investments. 
It's the right side that helps us grow our money to beat inflation, to help us stay well. It is also the side that we have less control over because we cannot control the markets. But most people are interested to focus on the right side because it's the more exciting side. So when we hear about economic data and all that, we tend to gravitate there. But it is really the short-term economic data that we receive. It's not meant for us to change our long-term investment strategy. It is meant for us to take stock of our left side. So what on the left side? First, we want to make sure that we increase our income and protect it. To have an income, to increase it, and to protect it. The left side is also about our savings and expenses. We want to increase our savings by controlling our expenses. So let's take it step by step. How do we increase our uh, income and protect it? The evergreen strategies are really in good times and bad to be the best at what we do at our work. And if we can do that, we can better safeguard our job and we can increase our income over time too. Now, after we have our income, it is very important to protect it. Why? Because in life, there are risks such as death, disability or medical crisis that can actually cause our income to stop. And we can use suitable and low cost insurance like term insurance to protect our income so that life can go on as normally as possible for either our families or ourselves. What about stress times like this? If we have lost a job or our spouse has and we need the additional income, we might have to consider taking a side job in times like this. Or you might want to go for some upskilling to stay relevant, uh, whether or not you have lost your job. But if you have, we, there are often training allowances that are given through the various uh, training partners uh, of the government. And the quote unquote good thing in a crisis is that there are many, many grants for training during this time. You might also want to consider either renting out a room or even selling personal assets, either decluttering and selling them on carousel or even selling jewelry. Now, it is not, this is not a good thing. It is not um, something that we like at all. But again, we have to make adjustments if we have to, because these are stress times, not normal times. What about increasing our savings? At all times, we want to be able to increase our savings by controlling our expenses or reducing them. And this can be done through good budgeting. It's also about managing our debt and lowering it so that we live within our means. And it's also the side that we talk about, uh, this left side is also where we talk about having enough emergency fund, which is especially important in a time like this. And when we are stressed, how can we further lower our expenses? Here, I will just list it about restructuring, uh, reducing or eliminating expenses, keeping our CPF ordinary account as a contingency fund, and maybe deferring some payments. But let me go first into budgeting. How can we budget to strengthen our financial position? Now, for budgeting, there's a planning part and an implementation part. The planning part takes a bit of work, but the good news is that once it's done, the implementation part is easier than the planning part. So in the planning part, I'd like all of us to first estimate our total net income. So let's say your gross income is 4,500. So your net income after CPF that you take home will be $3,600. The second step then, I'd like us to target the amount that you want to save. Save first, this is called paying yourself first. We target a minimum of 15% of gross income. So in this case, it's 15% of 4,500 or $675. In step three, we estimate our expenses. Now let's say your expenses are just nice, 2,925. Basically your take home minus your savings is uh, 2,925. But let's say if your expenses were 3,500, then what does it actually mean? It means that you can't achieve your targeted savings because that would, that would actually mean that you don't have enough to make, you know, if 3,600 minus, uh, minus uh, 675, is, you know, 3,005 is much higher than this. So what do we want to do then? What we want to do is reduce these expenses so we can continue to pay ourselves first. And out of expenses, step four. 
we break it down into fixed expenses and variable expenses. Now, what are fixed expenses? Fixed expenses are those expenses that aren't going to change in the next 12 months. So what are these? Fixed expenses are things like your mortgage payments, your insurance payments, maybe the tuition fees that you pay. Well, it's discretionary or optional, but it is quite fixed. Uh, your utilities, well, utilities usually we, they're actually technically variable expenses because they can go up and down, but the uh, variability is actually very small. So for purposes of budgeting, we can count it as a fixed expense. And then the rest of it, so after you take your total expenses, minus fixed expenses are variable expenses, things like groceries, things like um, your food bills when you go out to eat. So that's step four. Now in step five, we ask you to set aside something called the bad mood fund. It is what you spend on when you are in a bad mood. Because one of the best ways to cure a bad mood is actually to do retail therapy. But the problem with that is that if you don't budget for it, you overspend. And when you come back, you're in a worse mood. So what we encourage you to do is really to set aside this amount. Any amount, it can be $50, 100 or $20 a month. Put it in a drawer, you can write it down, make a mental note. But whatever it is, you know, when you see a drawer full of money, you know you can spend without guilt to cure your bad mood. Or maybe just by seeing that whole drawer worth of money, it will already put you back in a good mood. So now we are ready to execute a budget. To execute a budget, you need three bank accounts. It can be from the same bank or different bank. And you should get internet banking to make it easier for you. The first account is your income account, and every month your net income will be paid here. The second account would be a savings slash investment account, and this is where every month you want to save that 675 of the targeted pay yourself first saving that we talked about. The third account is for your fixed expenses, mortgage, insurance, premiums, taxes. So at the beginning of every month, you will get your income into this first account at $3,006. You use a standing instruction from the bank to channel 675 to the saving investment account and another standing instruction to channel $1,000 to your fixed expense account. Then what is left here will then be 1925 for your variable expenses. And your savings account is the one account from which you invest, but after you reach your emergency fund. Now, what do I mean? We recommend that you keep six months worth of expenses in cash as an emergency fund. Very important, especially during this time, if you can build it up. So since your total expenses are 2,925, you multiply 2,925 by six, it gets you 17,550. We recommend you save towards that first. And then after that, whatever is above that, your, your monthly uh, in, uh, investment amount, the money amount of six and five, then, then be invested. Now, for your fixed expenses, this is the account that you link to your gyro, or if you use checks still, you use that to pay your fixed bills. And for your income account, here you link it to your ATM card and a debit card. And we suggest a debit card so that you do not go into debt. Now, if you use this budgeting system, it's quite a simple one. Uh, it's probably good for those of us who don't like to use expense trackers and all that. At the end of the year, you should see a nice steady sum in your saving or investment account and you should be able to pay your fixed expenses and you should not run out of money in any month to pay your variable expenses because you have uh, used a debit card and not incurred debt. But what if times are stressed? What else can we do to about the absolute level of expenses that we face? Now, we can consider a number of strategies. One is to restructure, restructure our insurance. Because many a time we buy insurance that is very expensive, but actually does not give us the coverage we need. So you might wish to relook your insurance and maybe choose, say, a low-cost term insurance uh, to give you the coverage. But uh, please do speak with an advisor because uh, this changing our insurance is not a like decision uh, and is really subject to a number of considerations, including your insurability due to your health. Perhaps we could restructure some of our activities and uh, what we spend on. Now, perhaps for our, our children, could we consider group tuition instead of individual uh, tuition? I know this is not something that uh, parents like, and I'm a parent myself, but sometimes we might have to look at activities you can't do the same way. Can we consider 
in grocery shopping cheaper brands like house brands or even frozen food instead of fresh. You can also reduce or eliminate expenses by taking a hard look at what we need and we don't need. Is it at all possible to do without a car or a helper? Maybe some enrichment programs? Can we uh, change our utilities consumption in terms of electricity especially? Now, these are not easy decisions, but it's a time for us that if we, we, we are having stress because of our income situation, these are some tips that we can, we can use. And for those of us who have been considering investing our CPF ordinary account, because there are many advisors who tell you to do so, you may wish to reconsider if there is a risk that you might lose your job or have a reduced income. Because when, press, when cash becomes precious, you might want to use your CPF ordinary account to pay your mortgage. And that could actually help you. But if you invested it, you might have to liquidate your investments at a loss. And finally, uh, Lorna will talk later about the possibility of deferring some mortgage loan or insurance premiums. So you do all this really to make sure that you can go through these tough times. And also you do all this to make sure that if you have already started investment, you don't have to liquidate your investments, but can stay invested. Now, even though some of us are not going through this stress, the crisis is actually a good time to review some of these things. What can we declutter from this left side of the equation? And even if the crisis doesn't hit me now, it could hit me in future. And the thing is that after this whole thing is over, perhaps we realize that some of these things actually we never really needed and we don't need to get them back even after life has gone back to normal. So that was the left side. What about the right side of our personal money equation, which is about investing? Now, for those of us on this webinar, probably we're at different stages and you might have different questions depending on whether you're new to investing, whether you're already on a monthly plan or you're already invested. Overall, we would like to say that the principle is that the crisis in the short term should not change the investing for the long term. What happens in the time frame of the left side should not change what you do on the right side of your money equation. But it is even more important during the crisis to talk about the right way of investing. Now, so should you start or continue with your monthly savings plan or investment plan? Now, first of all, investing is something you should do only if you are financially fit and healthy. And these are some metrics that I've listed here. If you're not healthy because you've suffered a reduced income, or lost a job, for example, please do not invest yet. And please reconsider or please consider deferring your RSPs if your pay cuts or job loss has threatened your financial health. It is very important to understand that investing is not a quick fix to short-term money problems. You can actually get into more problems if you have that mindset. Now, if you're healthy and invested, what should you do in such volatile times when the markets seem crazy? Should you sell and buy back later since the market seems so high now? Now, this is what we call market timing. And market timing, generally speaking, is to try to buy as much as possible near the lows, which are circle in orange here, and to sell near the high circle in uh, dark teal. Now, does it work? So, if you believe in timing the markets, let's consider uh, this study, which is adapted from a study done by uh, Mr. Michael Mabusin, formerly from Lake Mason. If you take the S&P 500, the US stock market, over, the, over about 41 years, and you did nothing, the annual returns, you just stay invested, annualized returns was 8.7%, very decent. If you're a great market timer and you manage to avoid the worst 50 days, your returns would jump jump up to 16.4%. But if you got 50 days wrong, just 50 days out of 41 years, your returns would fall quite a bit to 2.6%. Here's a second study. It was done by Mr. Burton McHill, who is the author of famous book, A Random Walk Down Wall Street. Over a period of 67 years, market has risen in 46 years, it's been even in three years, and declined only in eight. So what do these two studies tell us together? Well, it tells us that if you're wrong, you're in quite a bad shape. The chances of you being wrong is three to one against you. And it's a very stressful way to invest. And 
what I want to say is that you aren't betting, you know, one dollars or even ten dollars of four D. Not that we encourage you to buy four D, but um, you know, some day last month, my colleague was very nice to me, you know, so I thought, wow, you know, it's a, it's a good day, you know, my lucky day. And I happened to be passing by uh, in Great Wall City, this, this, uh, this little booth. So I thought, okay, why don't I, I, I just, you know, it's a lucky day, you know, I just felt like it. I just we put $10 or $20. Now, I took financial advice from the lady behind the counter because I don't know what to do. And she said, why do you put 10 big, 10 small? Now, apparently the big means you win the small prizes, the small means you make the big prizes. It's a bit, it's a bit strange. But anyway, so of course, at six o'clock that day, I checked my, my Singapore pools and of course I didn't win. And I lost $20. Oh, did I really care? No, because I know the odds were against me and I knew that, but it's just $20, right? But what if it was something important? Your life goal, you know the chances are bad. Not as bad as 4D, but three to one against you. Would you stake your retirement and your children's education on this bet? The percentages may not mean much, but let's put some numbers to it. If it's over a period of 30 years or so, and you thought stock markets were too high and you sold and you missed, you missed just 25 days. For every $1,000, you will not have made 13,000, which you could have. Instead, you will have made only 3,000. That's a big fall of a big, big difference of about 75%. So missing even just a few days can drastically impact your goal. So that's really um, not, it's, it's, it's when you are actually making a bet that does not have good odds. And what are you betting? You're betting your life goals uh, on this timing of the market. And the good news is actually there's no need to time the markets. This is a chart of the global index, the MSCI developed world index. And from 1970, it's been through so many crises, you know, the, the so-called oil crisis, there are the um, two Iraq wars, Russian crisis, of course, the global financial crisis and Brexit and so on. But it's continued to go on an uptrend over time. It's counterintuitive, but it's the discipline of keeping to your plan and discipline of doing nothing that helps you to actually manage the risk and reap the rewards. Whereas if you try to be too active and move in and out, you actually add to the risk of turning a temporary decline into a permanent loss. So the lesson from history and logic is really there's no need to time the market. What does history tell us? A major crisis happens now and then it hits the markets. Not every year, not every two years, but now and then. And the second lesson is no matter how bad a crisis, the stock market always recovers. No matter how bad it is, it always recovers. And the stock market goes up in the long run. Why is this so? Why is it that when you talk to investment people, they say the expected return on stocks and so and so, and this expected return is positive, which means the stock market in the long run goes up. The economic logic is this. Stock prices are ultimately driven by the earnings of companies in aggregate, if you talk about the global market. And what are earnings driven by? They're driven by demand. Now, we might be in a, in a difficult situation now, in a webinar and all that, but did you watch Netflix, Korean drama? Did you buy toilet paper? Did you buy toothpaste? Did you order Mac delivery to go along with our webinar? The thing is that there are companies in every crisis that benefit even as there are companies that suffer. And this is all demand, demand of companies earning, that, that contribute to companies earnings in the long run on a globalized level. And what drives demand ultimately is population growth and increase in standards of living. Now, the, what about this thing about stock markets being too high? I know it seems very difficult right now, and we cannot see any upside when the, the economy is so bad. But, if we look back into history, actually, it is not an unusual thing. And, and it's also uh, logical from the point of view that markets incorporate all the information and markets are about the future. Stock markets do not price in today's earnings and today's news. They have moved past that. They always price in the future dollar of the earnings of companies in aggregate. So this is not to say that we will not have a second uh, dip. It's just that it's not so unusual for markets to move ahead of fundamentals. It's not so unusual that it's worth your guessing the markets are stressing over. So in summary, investors should stay put if you are invested. If you have been advised the right way, the work of, should have been done before the volatility happened. You should have been matched to a good portfolio 
that matches uh, of, of equities and bonds, the right allocation matching your need, ability and willingness to take risk. And staying invested means you get the average return of the markets, which is a good return. It won't be the highest return for the best market timers, but you also do not risk that three in one against you odds uh, kind of risk uh, to, to, to lose the market, to get much lower returns or even negative returns. It is a much less stressful way to invest. However, there are two conditions. Whatever I just said, you must have time. If you are investing 100% in equities, and I said before, equities reinvesting is not a quick way to get out of money problems. You must have time. If you want to be fully in equities, we recommend at least 10 years. If you don't have 10 years, then you have to add some bonds to smoothen out the volatility in case you need to liquidate it uh, before these 10 years. So say if you have about six years, uh, you may, maybe have about 60% in bonds or so. Your advisor should be able to recommend something suitable for you. The second condition is that you must be invested in globally diversified markets. What I just said just now that, you know, always recovers, goes on the long run, does not apply if you buy one stock. If that stock fails, there's no chance of recovery. It does not apply if you buy five stocks or even 30 stocks. It applies to the whole market for globally diversified portfolios. So very quickly, if we go back to the personal money equation. We see here again on the left side, this is where we can do some work. And it takes discipline, effort, and courage, but it's under our control and will help us ultimately so that we can do something good for ourselves. The right side, we leave to the markets to do that work. Let's not confuse you know, motion for progress or activity for effectiveness in any part of our life and not, especially not when it comes to our important goals. So I'm coming to a close, but I just want to touch very quickly on the third type of decision I had spoken about that you might need to make during this crisis or that you can make during this crisis. The first was a financial planning decision, the second an investing decision, and the third type is actually a life decision. As we go through this crisis, perhaps we can declutter our lives and figure out what is really important to us. If we can bring our income up and our expenses down, then we'll have a surplus. And we can, how we manage this surplus, besides investing it into markets for the long term, which is important, perhaps, can we also consider investing it in, into how it can enable purposeful living for us that's in line with what we figured out is important to us? Perhaps it's about spending some time with money and certain activities together, or if you're able to still contribute towards a cause that's important to you. It all starts from what's meaningful and from a posture of seeking sufficiency uh, rather than maximizing, be it activities, be it expenses, or even trying to maximize uh, investment return in the short run. So that we can, uh, when we do that, we realize we don't need to run after everything, you know, either what we spend or how we invest, because we don't actually need everything to be content. I'd like to leave you now with a thought from the famous author, Jim Collins, who wrote about the mindset that would help us during a difficult time. And Jim Collins wrote, and this is called the Stop Deal Paradox after a Vietnam a war hero, says that in difficult times, maintain unwavering faith that you can and will prevail in the end, regardless. And at the same time, have the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality. To maintain unwavering faith and yet confront the brutal facts. This is a faith that we need to maintain even if some of us, perhaps we have lost our job or we are facing reduced income, our spouse is going through difficulty. But this faith is not a blind faith. It requires discipline to do things that you don't like to do, things that other people don't like to do, but you confront it head on, these brutal facts, and you take the necessary steps, but you maintain that in the end, you will prevail. And with this mindset, all of us can manage and thrive financially in this difficult environment. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.